I remember one of my first assignments right out of academia was to start this thing called Recycling, a blue box program. Nobody really knew much about it, you know, and, and so we started imagining how we could get people to separate waste. And at that time, going back 30 years, uh, there were a lot of critics. People said, uh, you're, you're, I'm never going to separate my waste. That's, that's not something I'm going to do. So we thought, okay, well, if that's the prevailing attitude, we need to approach it differently. We can't go to the adults, who tend to be the decision makers. We found out the real decision makers are their children. And so that was the focus. We purposely focused on children, so we went to schools and added it to curriculum, and we spoke, we did a lot of meetings just like this to get people to think a little bit differently about what they do with their household waste. And uh, it worked. It was, it was really a form of social engineering. We, we got to the kids, and, and when the kids badgered their parents, if any of you have kids, you know we tend to capitulate eventually and do what the kids want to do. Uh, so we purposely approached it that way, not just not just here in Ontario, but, but uh, uh, across the country. Uh, I was at the city of Kingston at the time, and, and uh, so we, we set about to, to do this. It was a slow start, but we, we got momentum, and, and we got to a point in a short three-year period where more people recycled than voted in a federal election. You think about that. It's still true. It's still true, right? So maybe that's a sad statement about voting, but it's a really good statement about the capacity for people to do something and take control. The reality is we have a lot more to do. Uh, we're not there yet. Um, I just heard on CBC uh, uh, Tuesday morning, Cornwall has said, you know, they're looking for a new, uh, they're looking at um, funding the closure of a landfill. That's a massive cost and it's a perpetual cost. And, and so, um, you know, they're looking at uh, 30 some million dollars just to close this land. Well, that's an enormous amount of money. Can you imagine what we could do with 38 million dollars to feed people and house people? And so, um, so what happens with waste management is we externalize those costs, right? And, and that's the regime we have in Ontario right now where a producer, a Lever Brothers produce the packaging, or they put the product in it, they make it look really good, they make it difficult to recycle, and they put it on the market and everyone buys it and then they need to do something with it. So that's externalizing a cost. That's a cost for the manufacturer to make that packaging, but they have no skin in the game after the consumer finishes with that product. That's changing, and I'm happy to say after 30 years, um, I wouldn't have predicted the Conservative government would have done it, but the Conservative government have um, set the table for a producer, it's called an extended producer responsibility regime in Ontario. That's a massive seismic shift in how we look at waste. What that means is that producers of packaging are going to be ultimately responsible from cradle to grave for that piece of packaging. That takes the pressure off municipalities. The, the taxpayer, you people are paying for waste management costs, but you have no control over what the producer makes their packaging out of. You have every bit of control over what you purchase. I think that's the theme here, mm -hmm. is that you do have control over that. You cannot purchase packaging that's blister packed and foil wrapped and, you know, it's, it's overly complicated. The thinking, the philosophy, is that if the manufacturer is responsible for paying for that uh, packaging, whether it's, it's recycled or composted or, or put in a landfill um, or energy from waste, uh, they're going to package things differently. So uh, I'm really happy to say it's coming. It's not coming quick enough. Uh, the, 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 the timeline for implementation isn't until 2025. We've been pushing as an industry to speed that up a little bit, but um, the point is it's changing and it's going to be changing for the good. So that's a little kind of regulatory, kind of province-wide look at, at waste management. But what we want to do tonight is really talk about what you can do in your own home to reduce your impact. And, I watched one of the videos that uh, Peter had sent out, and there are five R's now. Back when I started, there were only three that were easy to remember. But we've added refuse, and I think rot is the other one. Uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit about composting. Uh, our good friend Tony uh, Mack from Perth is here. He's an expert in composting, and he uh, looks after the operations of waste management uh, in the town of Perth. So he's going to talk a little bit about composting. And uh, it's a pretty simple thing. I've been doing it for a long time. Uh, it, it's not rocket science. Um, you need to balance it out. Tony will tell us all about the things that you need to do.
but uh, it's a really simple, the most inexpensive way to handle your sleeping. And um, so there's lots of things we can do that you can take control and, and, and manage your own uh, footprint that you uh, produce in terms of, of weight. So with that said, uh, I'm going to bring up Tony and he's going to tell us uh, about what's happening in Perth. product. You see the little uh, 
the little black perfected compost. And right here is all the plastics and even biodegradable plastics, which which are deemed uh, compostable or biodegradable, and it states right on the on the boxes that uh, they're acceptable in most municipal waste programs. This is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. So that's what it all comes out of. Mm -hmm. And conclusion. Uh, as you can see here, uh, composting diverts waste from landfills. It supports Ontario's food and organic waste policy statement. Uh, creates a reusable resource. Minimizes gas buildup within landfills. All that good stuff. That's all I have. Short and sweet. Uh, yes, sir. What do you do with the uh, compost that went inside the finished screen? So right now, the town of Perth only uses the compost for town of Perth items, so for municipal uses only. So right now, we don't sell it. Tony, what about the pile that had all the white stuff in it? What what happens to that? That. All of this stuff here will then go into the landfill. So some of that is organic, like twigs and avocado seeds, yeah. and some of it are some of it plastics is. and things that should never have yeah, gone yeah. in. Because we can't remove the plastic from these sticks, it right. doesn't go down <coughs> the property line. Right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I guess kind of question and comment. I was going to say for the even for the organic component of that waste pile. I mean, based on what we've learned about what goes to landfill, because it's anaerobic, right? Yeah. That stuff will take forever to degrade, basically, right? It's not going to be gone next year because it's in this wet, you know, environment lacking oxygen under a landfill. Yeah. So, you know, I think we can't get complacent or comfortable to sort of think, oh, well, the organic part of it's just going to break down anyway. So. Yeah, right. that's, that's correct. It'll stay in the landfill for a long period of time. Right, so right. even the natural stuff. And then the other quick comment was, um, so we're, uh, the two of us, uh, my colleague and I are the organizers for the film on, uh, coming up on February 1st, um, part of the environmental film series in Perth. And uh, for the first film that we had in uh, November, we had uh, Mayor Fennick as one of our um, panel uh, members for panel discussion. Right. And so he was talking about the Perth composting and. Uh, and I didn't realize this, but one of the things that, that was kind of like a, I guess, sort of a, a frightening and disappointing statistic was he said that, you know, when they screen the compost that they can't actually sell it or give it back to, you know, the, the citizens of Perth because of the risk of things like, you know, a needle in it and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And which is really unfortunate. And I'm thinking, you know, had people begun to try to look at ways around that? Because, of course, there's a liability and a risk. Uh, and it's great that Perth is using it, but wouldn't it be nice if mm -hmm. it could go back to the citizens, or, or even if they have to buy it for a bag, but just, mm -hmm. you know, is so there a way I, around that? I agree with that. Um, trying to get around the liability issue is definitely something we're working really hard at, yeah. and this has been taking some time. Over the past two years, um, we've actually uh, done additional testing okay. to the compost to, to try <laughs> to ease these liability issues, but it just, it's just not enough yet to, to actually begin giving back to right. the town of Perth. Uh, previously, we did do the uh, compost giveaway where residents were allowed to come in and you can take as much as you can carry. Wow. Yeah, uh, Are there examples yeah. of what other communities have done to get around this slavery? Yes, yeah, I have uh, been in contact with other municipalities. Great. And it's just a sign. It, it's just a sign where, where you buy it. Yeah. Um, and maybe, let me interrupt because we do have a question and answer session. Up to all the speakers are okay. asked. Okay, so so hold on, write all write those questions down. And if you don't have enough time to answer it, uh, leave it to us. We will send your question to the experts and we'll give you the answer. Okay. Sign of a good leader, he's keeping us on track. He is. <laughs> Something the MC should be doing. But thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tony. Tony has a job that some people would say is rotten, but he makes it sound really exciting. So thank you. Just going back to the regulatory uh, regime in Ontario, uh, composting is kind of looked at as by the province as kind of the next frontier to get us to closer to a zero waste society. So I understand by 2025 it'll be mandatory in some communities. What's the threshold? Um, is it over 50,000? For, for municipal urban centers? 
get 300 people per kilometer. So oh, it's density? Yes, the oh. population is density. If, however, if you're in a rural area, it's uh, 50,000 population. That's what I thought. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's, it, there's an if and an or there. <coughs> and, and that threshold is uh, if you're within that group, then the municipality is required yes. to have a formalized um, organic subversion program. Is yes, that right? Yes, you can yeah. for organic material. Right. Okay, excellent. So, uh, hold those questions and we'll, uh, we'll answer <laughs> all of them and more at the end. Now we have Kathy Green from Drummond North Helmsley, and Kathy's going to enlighten us about recycling. Yeah. So, are you going to launch me there, Vanessa? Did you have a, um, a clicker? Uh, no, this is for my. Ah, uh, gotcha. Okay. Does this work? Uh, yeah, we have okay. uh, You could put this in. Oh, it doesn't matter. Sorry. how the room filled up after I arrived. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk to you about recycling and um, that's, those are my subheadings. Where does it go after it leaves my driveway? What happens to it? Is it really transformed into new items? Because that's what I teach the kids in the school is it's transformative to recycle. It's like magic. And what about the global collapse of the recycling industry? Isn't, don't, aren't we reading in the newspapers how we're going to hell in a handbasket and it's really all being landfilled, right? So I thought we might want to touch on that. I appreciate Malcolm having talked about the um, provincial picture. So thank you, Bill. Quick reminder, and I'm so pleased to be talking to the converted. Um, <coughs> I get really concerned when people go to the grocery store and say, oh, well, I really would prefer not to buy my salad greens in a plastic clam fill container, but oh, well, at least it's recyclable. And one of the things that I want to tell you about is that recycling takes a lot of energy, a lot of resources. We pick it up in a truck, we transport it in the truck, we drive it up to the Mercs in the truck, it gets trucked after it's bailed, this material is moving all over the countryside. So the waste reduction is definitely where we're at as far as the journey to sustainability. Um, reusing, reducing waste like Tony's talking about with compost, which is also transformative as you know. So recycling is a means of disposal. And the reason that we recycle is really to save space in the landfill. And many of the municipalities in this part of the world no longer have landfills like Smith Falls. In Drummond North Elmsley, we're lucky to have decades still remaining in our little local landfill. We're just moving into a second phase of our landfill operation, which is going to give us decades more space. So that's really why we recycle, is to save the natural resources that go into manufacturing, but it's also to save landfill space. So where does it go after it leaves my driveway? It goes to a material recovery facility. And if you look up MRF on Google, you will see all kinds of cool little videos that show you what it looks like when it's moving. But a MRF is simply a factory where all the material gets <coughs> sorted into its streams. And it's sorted by wind currents, um, conveyor belts, magnets, and human beings as well. This is called the tipping floor inside the building. And when we, oh, th those are human beings touching the stuff that was in your recycling bin. So this is why we get concerned about things like broken glass and hypodermic needles going in your recycling bin because this is not a fully mechanized process. There are still people putting their hands on these things. There's an example of the conveyor belt. And our base, our big streams are cans, plastic, glass, paper, boxboard, and cardboard. But as you know, plastic comes in many different um, numbers, one through seven, with our little resin code on the bottom. 
Cans come in steel and aluminum. Glass comes in clear and colored. So there are subcategories, but those are those are the big picture streets. That's the tipping floor. And the day that we visited the Murph up in Renfrew, a truck from Smith Falls was unloading its fiber load. That's what it looks like when it comes out of the truck onto the floor. And that's what it looks like after it's all been separated into corrugated cardboard, box board, mixed paper. It is literally compacted together into these enormous bales, loaded onto trucks, and driven off to other factories. This is the point at which the Merck is selling the material to another manufacturer who is going to make something else out of it. I, I sort of matured my school presentation. This is done for kids, but I made it for grown-ups tonight. So there you see the, um, the bales getting ready to go on their truck ride. And then we have bales of, of cans, and so we have steel and aluminum. The good thing about metal recycling is that the material can really be used over and over and over again. It's amazing how quickly a can can go from retail, be used, and go through recycling and end up back on the shelf as another can. <coughs> and here are a few pictures of some of the things that we can make cans into. Voila. This is a great um, public service campaign that ran in Manitoba, and they wouldn't let us use it in, their in our official advertising campaign, but I think the pictures are great. So. Okay, and so plastic, as you know, comes in seven different um, streams, and we may say, you know, in Drummond North Elmsley, we accept one through seven, except number six, polystyrene. We don't accept re, um, styrofoam. So the thing with plastic is that it really degrades when it is recycled. Um, many kinds of plastic can only be recycled once or a handful of times. That's one of the reasons why we can't accept things in the recycling stream that are made from recycled plastic. So you will find plastic lawn chairs, um, different kinds of laundry baskets, you know, plastic hangers, those kinds of things. We cannot accept those in recycling. One of the reasons is because they probably already have a proportion of recycled plastic in it, and it has a limited life in terms of the number of times it can be recycled. PET, which is what water bottles are made out of, is the exception. I learned this recently in an article. It can be indefinitely recycled like metal. And there is actually a company in Ontario which launched its own recycling plant because they recycle plastic bottles back into new plastic bottles. So plastic bottles, different streams of plastic have different value on the market, and PET is one of the most valuable because it can continuously um, be reused. So here are some of the kinds of things that might be made from recycled plastic, but please don't put that chair out for collection with your recycling. This is you know, one of the ads we use, get comfortable recycling your plastic. It looks really nice when we go to the cottage and we're all happy and relaxed about having our plastic. And I also learned recently that most plastic is recycled into fibers. So it might be your jacket, it might be the stuffing in a pillow or part of a mattress. That's where the largest percentage of recycled plastic ends up in fibers. So then we come to the fiber stream, <coughs> mixed paper, box, board, <coughs> cardboard, all comes into the Merck for sorting. They are then transformed into things like an egg carton. Isn't that a clever picture? <laughs> Tetra packs and juice boxes also transformed into things like book covers, Kleenex boxes. And then we have glass. The market for glass is very poor. It adds a lot of cost to municipal recycling programs. 
So one of the things that we ask people to do is to make sure that you don't put your deposit containers in the recycling bin if they could be returned to the beer store. There's the little public service announcement we put out in Drummond North Elmsley. We have a landfill and people can bring their deposit containers and all the um, money go to the Drummond Scouts. Uh, I know Tay Valley and some of the Lanark Highlands landfills do the same thing. We really encourage you to take those bottles back to the beer store or give them to some kind of charitable drive. We do waste audits in Drummond North Elmsley and based on the sampling of 200 homes, we've come up with the figure of $25,000 every year in Drummond North Elmsley that goes into the recycling. That's $25,000 that the Drummond Scouts could have or you know maybe I could get a few if I took my own bottles back. But who's actually getting that money when it goes into the landfill? landfill? Nobody. Yes, LCBO and Beer Store are making that money because we pay them the deposit and if nobody brings that container back, they get to keep it. So that's your little lesson in capitalism for the day. It's really <coughs> worth sorting. Again, it's just a matter of sorting the waste, right? It's really worth pulling those bottles out and encouraging your neighbors to do the same thing. Um, because that's adding cost to our municipal service and enriching the pockets of, of corporations. So at the very least, let's give them to the scouts or you know, if someone has a bottle drive. But you can actually recycle glass even though the market isn't very good. One of the places where it goes is into asphalt to strengthen our roads. Okay, so there are some rules about recycling and it only works if we put the right things in the blue box and in the yellow box. Moving on, thanks. Okay, so when you think about what can go in there, think consumer packaging. Malcolm was talking about extended producer responsibility. Currently, municipalities get approximately 50% of the cost of the municipal recycling program paid back to us by the stewards. They will soon be paying that 100%. And the idea is, if they have to pay the cost of recycling, perhaps they will choose materials that are more easily managed in that system, <laughs> that have more value, and that can be recycled multiple times. So molded cardboard instead of styrofoam, popcorn instead of styrofoam peanuts, whatever those answers might be, there are choices out there. Food containers need to be empty and rinsed. I hear stories of people cleaning out their fridge and putting the whole thing <coughs> in the blue box, and that turns that recycling load into garbage. So it's really important to follow the rules about what can go in there. And that banana peel belongs in Tony's compost pile, not in the blue box, because it really will contaminate the load once that goes to the market. We get a lot of questions about plastic bags and unfortunately those clear blue bags are sold and right on the box it says recycling bags and I actually had a resident call and tell me that we should forbid the stores to sell those if they are not accepted in the local recycling programs. So the reason they can't go in the recycling bin is because the Merck can't handle it at the other end. It is the sorting facility that really determines what we can collect at the curb. And most Mercs cannot handle um, stretchy film plastic that gets caught up in the machinery. We are now asking our residents to put shredded.